We are going to <clears throat> visit an old friend today. Uh, we are going to look to the Shunammite. We are going to look to uh, uh, others as well as we go through to see what it is that God wants, what God has done, what He's speaking to us, and what He'd like us to do differently in our lives. As we look to the account of history and what God has done in accordance with the book of 2 Kings. And in 2 Kings chapter 8, we are introduced to our old friend, the Shunammite woman. Do you remember her? The Shunammite woman was mentioned to us back in, uh, in uh, 2 Kings chapter 4. And in 2 Kings chapter 4, uh, she is the one that acknowledged or recognized that Elisha was a man of God. She asked her husband if she could build an upper room completely furnished for him, that he might just have a spot to, to rest, to a respite in his journeys and in his ministry. And, and, and what's more, what happened was some miraculous things. I mean, God blessed the Shunammite woman for her generosity with the son. Regrettably, her son had passed away unexpectedly, I mean, within the period of a day. Uh, and the woman, diligently seeking out uh, Elisha, and miraculously, miraculously, her son was brought back to life. We haven't heard from the Shunammite since that account, since that account. But now uh, we are introduced again to her in 2 Kings chapter 8. Do you have it open? You have 2 Kings chapter 8 open? Good. Now let's open our hearts. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we open up your word to learn who you are, to learn who we are, and to know better that gap that separates us called sin. Lord, we're so very thankful that you are a powerful God, greater than the sin that is in us. And so we ask this morning as we open up your word and open up our hearts and minds that you would have your way with us, that you would lead and guide that your spirit would lead me, that I might be on your same page, and that each and every person here might feel and sense and know your personal desire to be involved in their lives, not just on Sunday, but each and every day. So be blessed in this time. Be glorified in this time that we dedicate to you. In Jesus' name, amen. 2 Kings chapter 8, verse 1. Now Elisha had said to the woman whose son he had restored to life, Arise and depart with your household and sojourn wherever you can. For the Lord has called a, for a famine, and it will come upon the land for seven years. So the woman arose and did according to the word of the man of God. She went with her household and sojourned in the land of the Philistine seven years. <laughs> Yet again, another famine. Right? I mean, doesn't it feel like we just read the end of a famine? We did. It was in chapter 7. <laughs> in chapter 7, there had been a famine. The entire town of Samaria was under siege. God lifted the siege. He took care of the famine. And some time has passed. How much time, I don't know. But this is just a demonstration yet again of God's unrelenting call of the nation of Israel to himself. And they continue to be disobedient. And they continue not to seek him. They continue in their idolatry. And so God says, okay, here comes another famine, and this one is for seven years. Seven years! Ladies and gentlemen, that is a long time, right? That's like half a Cooper's life. Oh, I know you're older than that. I, I'm better at math than that. Yeah. Yeah, seven years is a long time. God shares with Elisha what's going to happen, this warning to the people, and then God goes, or Elisha goes to the, uh, the Shunammite woman, uh, this incredible relationship. I just love this woman. I love their relationship with each other, and, and just this, this constant God focus of everything that's taking place, and he just says, he says, you need to leave. There's going to be a famine. Go wherever you can, you and your household. And she does. She's obedient. She's obedient. Don't title uh, a lot of sermons, but uh, you know, as we go through, we're going to talk about two things today: obedience and repentance. Right? Those aren't very popular themes in Christendom. Very necessary, but not very popular. Why aren't they very popular? Because they go against our instinctive and very proud, independent attitude. We are Americans, 
and we live in a democracy and we value hunker down you can do it work harder you've got this case in point <clears throat> You don't have to watch the news for very long at certain points in time of year, right? Where inevitably there will be some kind of natural disaster. A natural disaster, right? Monsoon rains, right? Uh, tsunamis, hurricanes, flash floods, and there'll be warning, warning, warning. And then somewhere in there, there's some redneck named John who's decided that he's just going to, you know, like, we're going to stick it out. No, the people are saying, get out, right? And no, we can do this. We survived the flood of 1900 and whatever. Now, and, and all of the warning signs are there to get out, get out, get out. And then like two days later, all of a sudden we see this little picture, right? Of all these rooftops and there's John and his dog on top of the roof. And now we have to rescue some, some rescuer's peril, right, to take the, the, the raging waters and snake-infested water and down trees. And now that poor guy's got to risk his life to go save John Boy's rear end because I can do this. I am more powerful than floods. I am more powerful than tsunamis. I'm more powerful, right? But here's the sad story. Sometimes people stay to their detriment and they die, Right? So praise God for the little people on the roof that get to be able to be rescued. But every time we hear one of those warnings, there's inevitably someone who dies. Flash floods, tsunamis, hurricanes, earthquakes, mudslides, great disasters. Ladies and gentlemen, sin is such a disaster. Yet in our independence and in our pride, we dabble in it. We think somehow, some way, we're going to overcome it. We don't pay attention to the warnings that God has given us over and over and over again. We should. We pay attention to the big ones. Oh, I better pay attention to this one. It's a cat five, right? But the eh, cat three and less, uh, and what I'm talking about are the warnings in God's word. Like, we're, every, everybody in the room is like, well, you know the one that says don't murder? That one? Got it. I'm not going to do that. But how about the one that says love your enemies, forgive those who do mean things to you, go and share the God? Well, we're kind of busy. But God's wisdom is such and so pervasive to all of our lives that the very things that we long for require us to pay attention to his counsel. As the psalmist would declare, his precepts, his ways, his testimony, his law. But all too often in our proud and independent mindset, we just think that God is just a God of heaven who has all of these rules, who's telling us what we can't do. And really what he's trying to do as our Heavenly Father, share with us His wisdom, His counsel, and His way to protect us, to give us good. The best good is to know Him, and then to follow Him and abide in Him, that He might be glorified, that others might know Him. And whenever we compromise, some form of that is less than. Finish my little John boy on the roof with his dog, Right? There was one great rescuer, and he came, and he laid down his life to rescue, to save. His name is Jesus. That's his heart. And on a good day, we can sit here and go, yeah, that's so dumb of me to be so stubborn. Yet then comes Tuesday. <laughs> and we have to be reminded of it. God is unrelenting in his desire to show his good if we would just be obedient. Continue on with me at verse 3. At the end of seven years, when the woman had returned from the land of the Philistines, she went to appeal to the king for her house and her land. Why? Because it was seven years. At some place or point in time, what's happened in the seven-year famine, you could about imagine as, as things go, right? Uh, Elisha says, hey, uh, Miss Shunammite, you need to pack it up and leave, you and your household. And she's like, looks right at him and says, okay, we're out of here. 
She leaves with everything she's got. She has resources to do so. And all her neighbors are kind of like, what's she doing? And as she's leaving, she's saying, there's going to be a great famine. The Lord has decreed, right? Seven years. So, you know, we need to all prepare. And the neighbors are like, we got this. We've survived the famine of chapter seven. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> there was no, ch yeah, right. Okay, thanks. But people are leaving, and as they're all leaving, right, or excuse me, as she's leaving, people are staying, and then one of three things happens, right? Either someone notices that she ain't coming back, oh, she's got a nice house, that's nicer than ours, let's move in, okay? Or uh, it was taken and, and, and seized by the king, or, you know, I mean, there, there's, there's and, and then the third option is, who knows? We just don't know, but what we do know is she left in obedience to the Lord, and her stuff was taken over. Her land and her farm, you're like, well, what about her husband? Her husband is not mentioned in the story, so we can assume that he's passed away and someone's taken advantage of a situation. Well, I wouldn't do that, right? Uh, in this situation, I mean, you can be forewarned not to take advantage of anybody in this situation, but what God is doing here is specific to show what he's doing. Don't get lost in the details like I am doing. So she comes back and she makes a, an appeal. Now look what happens in verse 4. Now the king was talking with Gehazi. Who's Gehazi? Do you remember him? Yes! All we have to do is go back and we can look at 1 Kings and we can see all of these different things that have happened with Elijah's servant Gehazi. Excuse me, Elijah. I'm getting. Gehazi is still a leper. We looked at him at the uh, in chapter seven. We looked at him in chapter five, and in chapter five, where Elisha, right, said you can have a name and treasure, but you're also going to have what he had. You can have his leprosy. He stands outside of the city walls during the then the uh, during the siege of chapter seven. And likely, likely, is one of the lepers that said, hey, what we're doing isn't good, and gets word to the king. I say that because now he's with the king and counseling him. And there is no room, no reason, no why, that a king would have a leper counseling him, except that maybe there's some sharing of this former siege and story. To the king's credit, he's asking Gehazi about the miracles of Elisha. Look with me at verse 4. The king was talking with Gehazi, the servant of the man of God, saying, Tell me all the great things that Elisha has done. And while he was telling the king how Elisha had restored the dead to life, behold, the woman whose son he had restored to life appeared to the king for her house and her land. And Gehazi said, My lord, O king, here's the woman, and here's her son whom Elisha restored to life. Wow! <laughs> what a coincidence! Yeah, not, right? God's timing is always perfect. God's timing is always there. This is very providential, very providential. Tell me about this man, Elisha, and all the great works he's done. And, and, and Gehazi goes straight to the big one. Boom. He says, well, there was this woman. And one time, and she had a kid, and it passed away, and he raised it to life. And there he is. Amazing. And in recognition of God's provincial timing and all that happens, the king has to make a decision. And the king says, verse 6, and when the king asked the woman, she told him. What is she telling him? What Gehazi said. And the king asked, is that true? And her testimony and the truth remains the truth remains the truth. And so she shares the truth and testimony of what God has done. What God has done. And so the king in um, response to the incredible testimony of what the Lord, in providential timing of what God is doing, the king appointed an officer for, say, uh, officer for her, saying, Restore all that was hers together with all the produce of the fields from that day that she left until now. Restoration. Restoration. Now a bit of a strike. I mean, these are the facts. These are the facts. That God spoke that there was going to be a famine. That God sent warning to the Shunammite that she obeyed. That she didn't double down on her independent and fiercely uh, minded uh, pr pride. That somehow she was going to wait it out. That she would keep all that was hers. But she used her resources to protect her family, her household. And she went and lived in the land of the Philistines. That wasn't necessarily easy. 
See, but there were other people who stayed the famine out who would later leave, but they exhausted all of their resources before they left. She didn't do that. She was immediate, she left, and now she's come back. She's come back to find things in ruin. The very thing that people would have stayed to hold on to, right? The very reason why there are warnings and nasty and tragic events of nature that people say, we're going to wait it out is so they can hold on to their earthly possessions somehow, some way, at threat of their life so that nobody else can take it. The Shunammite didn't do that. In trust and in obedience, and that's what obedience is. Obedience is the trusting of God for something greater to trust God for something that I may not necessarily be able to rationalize or to see. And that is the wrestle that we have every time we encounter a piece of God's wisdom that's contradictory to how we think. We may think a thing, or we may think like this, or we may think like that, but God says, no, you need to see how I see and trust me. And in the end, in doing so, God is a God of restoration. Ultimately, we will be restored to our position in his family the way he intended before sin. If we can just let go of all of this earthly desire of things and position. God is a God who is redeeming, restoring. There's another side of this coin. One side is restoration. The other side is decimation. Look with me at chapter 8, verse 7. Now Elisha came to Damascus. That's the capital city of the king of Syria. Elisha came to Damascus, and ben -Hada, the king of Syria, was sick. Not too far away, chapter 6, verse 24, this is the same man that was set besieged, right, to uh, Samaria, who insisted at one place and point in time that he was going to kill Elisha. Elisha means forward, the things that God has seen, he is now seeking Elisha out. Uh, you might also wonder too, why is a prophet of God called to the nation of Israel? What's he doing in Damascus? Why is he going someplace else? This is a little extra biblical, but I'll take the time to share my rambling thoughts. Thought one, it's possible, just like today, that God's word Right? God decrees that we are to go and to make disciples, to go and share. That God's word is not for us to just take and hold unto ourselves. So the prophet sharing with anyone who would listen, that's a possibility. Part number two, we've been introduced to the Shunammite, right? And uh, her uh, gifts that she was given for her generosity, the restoration of her son, now the restoration of her farm. We've been introduced to the king of, uh, of uh, Samaria, the king of Israel, who once also tried to seek Elijah's life, Elisha's life, and now he wants to hear about God's mighty deeds. Ben Hada, the king of Syria, who once set besieged to Samaria, now he's laying sick, and all of his idols, all of his idols, they're not worth the hoot. So he hears that the man of God's in town. He says, I need to seek this guy out. And oftentimes when we wonder why crisis is allowed into our lives, it's because that is the boiling point to getting rid of all the other things to seek the one true God. And yet there is one, like I said, one more point. Elisha's there and impossibility since we've been introduced to all these characters. So where is Naaman? Naaman is the right hand man, right, of the king. And in this full account of all of these different things, it's possible it's possible that Elisha might be there to just encourage Naaman as well. So in all of these things, the reason I share all of these possibilities is the duplicity of God is such that wherever you would go, as said to the Shunammite, wherever we would go, our call is to be obedient to God's word and to his decree and to share the character of God with others without reservation. That God might work somehow, some way in our obedience to share with others his love, his decrees, his way, his son, Jesus. And Hadar the king of Syria was sick, I'm in verse 7. And when it was told him the man of God has come, the king said to Hazael, Take a present with you and go and meet the man of God. And inquire of the Lord through him, saying, Shall I recover from my sickness? So Hazael went to meet him and took a present to him. All kinds of goods of Damascus, 40 camel loads, 
And when he came and stood before him, he said, Your son, ben king of Syria, has sent me to you, saying, Shall I recover from this sickness? Uh, I had a thought, uh, but we'll save that for another time. Verse 10, And Elisha said to him, Go and say to the king, You shall certainly recover, but the Lord has shown me that he will certainly die. Interesting. Almost paradoxical. You will recover, but someday you will die. Another time, another place. Verse 11. And then Elisha fixed his gaze and stared at Hazael until Hazael was embarrassed and the man of God wept. You can underline that. This is a... This isn't just a passing glance. The king of Syria is seeking God's wisdom. And God working through Elisha has shared truth. King of Syria will live, but then he will die. Then comes this deep gaze as though Elisha is looking at the very soul of Hazel. And then he begins to weep. So uncomfortable was that moment that Hazel, the king's officer, it says, becomes embarrassed. It's like standing naked in the street. Like everybody at that place or point in time, everything about his life must have been exposed. That's what God's word will do to us. If we peer long enough and spend enough time rightly seeing the character of God and the truth of his word, everything about our lives will be exposed. This is why people shut it, don't open it, won't look at it. This is why people will form opinions about God and those who read the Bible. This is why the United States of America only has a 6% biblical worldview. You see, God desires an intimate and personal relationship with each and every one of us. Not just so that we can go to heaven someday, but that he might warn us of the pitfalls of the world if we would allow the gaze of God to peer right into our very soul. The Word of God is living and active, able to cut through bone and sinew and discern the very thoughts and intentions of a man's heart. That tense moment and the prophets weeping. Verse 12, Hazael said, Why does my Lord weep? He answered, Because I know the evil that you will do to the people of Israel. You will set on fire their fortresses, and you will kill their young men with the sword, and dash into pieces their little ones, and rip open their pregnant women. Yikes. And Hazael said, What is your servant, who is but a dog, that he would do this great thing? And Elisha answered, The Lord has shown me that you are to bring you are to be king over Syria. And then Hazael departed from Elisha, and he came to his master, who said to him, What did Elisha say to you? And he said, He told me that you would certainly recover. But the next day he took a bedcloth, dipped it in water, spread it over his face, and suffocated him till he died. And Hezekiel, and excuse me, and Hazael became king in his place. Yikes! Interesting um, turn of events. When you read this, when you hear this, 
Is there any part of you that thinks to yourself, ooh, wow, maybe Elisha shouldn't have told him that. <laughs> right? <laughs> maybe, El maybe Elisha shouldn't have, uh, has you, right? But let's back up. Um, this isn't Elisha's fault. This isn't Elisha's fault. God gave Elisha a vision and a glimpse, and he spoke the truth. Never once does Elisha say, right, how Hazael will become king. Never once does Elisha say how Ben-Hadad will die. Never once does Elisha say, you should assassinate the king. I like that interaction, right? Weeping. Elisha says to Hazael, I can see what you will do to the nation of Israel. The horrible, awful things you will do. Hazael, he does, he does, he hear, upon hearing all that, he said, what is it, what am I? Am I some kind of dog? To which Elisha said, no, I like dogs too much. You're worse than that. You're a rat. <laughs> Okay, that, that's in my version. <laughs> but the one thing that Azael did not do is the one thing we all must do. When confronted by evil, when confronted by sin, when confronted by the possibility of those things, there is a, there's a, there's a call to repentance. And that Azael does not do. He makes accusation of the prophet justification, but there is no repentance. His heart is not set to follow godly wisdom. And that repentance that was needed would not have in any way affected the vision of the prophet or God's word to say, but what Hazael did was to take unto his own, right? Take unto his own and make himself by murder. And again, it never ceases to amaze me that James chapter 4 continues to prove true over and over and over again. What is the source of quarrels and fighting amongst you? Isn't it that you want, you can't have, right? So you murder. Which seems like a far stretch for any of us except for the accounts of history where we have seen just such things like we have here. There is, in our fiercely independent minds, we've made up our mind of the things that we will not do. And even though God's word says you are fully capable of all of these things, no, I'm not. And thus there is this conflict between us and God to how far we can go and what we will do to garner, garner his blessings, but that in our own power we will thwart the curse or the consequences. And somehow, some way, we dabble in all of these things. Spurgeon said it this way. Spurgeon said, our ignorance of the depravity of our hearts is a startling fact. Our ignorance of the depravity of our very own hearts is a startling fact. Hazael did not believe that he was bad enough to do these things. So we too convince ourselves that we could never be bad enough to do these things. Thinks everyone except for the individual who is caught in the consequences of trespass that have brought them to places and positions they never thought would occur except for one decision. Spurgeon went on to say, he said he didn't think he was bad enough to do these things, but I appeal to you Christian men and women. If anyone had told you that you would love your Savior so little as you have done, if any prophet had told you in the hour of your conversion that you would have served Jesus so feebly as you have done, would you have believed it? These two are the, the, the call of God. Don't forsake coming together as some are in the habit of doing. Go 
and make disciples, sharing with them all that I've taught you. Love God, love others, serve, serve, abide in me, spend time with me, pray, encourage one another, love one another, support one another. So we convince ourselves, I'd never murder. But we compromise and dabble on some of the other things that God has called us to as participants in his word and in his counsel and his way. So that we might experience more of the things of God and that others might experience his good as well. That our hearts might become more like the prophet, excuse me, uh, more like the psalmist. Where the psalmist said in Psalm chapter 19, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving my soul. The testimony of the Lord is pure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing in the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than all the gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of honeycomb. Home. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, in keeping them there is great reward. The beginning of the book of Psalms in Psalm 1, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law he meditates day and night. Psalm 18, this is God. His way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. He is a shield for all of those who take refuge in him. For who is God but the Lord? And who is a rock except our God? The God who equipped me with strength and made my way blameless. He made my feet like the feet of a deer. He set me on secure heights. He trains my hands for war so that my arms might bend a bow of bronze. You have given me the shield of your salvation and your right hand support me and your gentleness made me great. You have a wide place for my steps under me and my feet will not slip. God has not changed. God has not changed. He has given us His Word as a gift. He's given of Himself in sending His Son. And He asks us to be obedient and to remain repentant. Spending time in His Word, abiding in our relationship with Him, so that He might have His very deep gaze into our very souls. Our independent and proud mindset sets us with a choice as to what we will and what we won't. And we sometimes find ourselves in compromise with what God is asking of us. God only has our good in mind. I fail you very regularly <laughs> on preaching all over the place and all kinds of different things. And I Got a little excited here today and lost my train of thought a few times, and I apologize for that, but I want to make sure that we have a singular point that we had all walk away from. What God wants is this, for us to know Him. He's invited us to know Him. He's given us Himself, His Son Jesus. He's given us His Word so that we might know His ways and His precept and His truth. He wants to know us not just on Sunday, but on each and every day. And what that requires is, is that we see God correctly. That we don't listen to the lies of the world who shares with us or has told us in our ear over and over who God must be when we can know who God is. Knowing who God is, seeing who we are, knowing what sin is and can do, not just in a moment, but what the depravity the decimation that can result in those things unchecked. That God is so very kind and loving that He continues, he continues to call. He, he does not relent to share with us His good wisdom and His way and His counsel. That He's not there waiting to punish us, but that He wants to set us free from the burden of the world if we would just obey We know how this is going to end in 2 Kings. Israel is divided. We have Israel to the north. We have Judah to the south. Israel is going to go into exile. And then not too long later, Judah is going into exile. 
They won't. They've been warned, they've been warned, they've been warned. And God said, if you keep this up, that's it. Somebody else is going to take over the covenant promise of the land that I gave you. Right? And so they're going to escape exile. And God continues to send prophets, even though we know and we will read shortly that Elisha will pass away. But in uh, Jeremiah, another man of God, God said this in Jeremiah chapter 29. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you. And I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for your welfare and not for evil. To give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore all of your fortunes and gather you from all other nations in the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. God loves us. He has a plan. He's made it known. And we must respond. Meryl, bring your team up. The interaction between Elisha and Hazel. Knowing the truth, Elisha wept. It reminds me when Jesus came into Jerusalem and knowing what would happen, he wept. Jesus didn't weep for himself, he wept for Israel. And the goal of our instruction is love. All too often when we're confronted by God's wisdom as something in our own lives, we respond in anger. And all too often when we see things that are going on in the world that are contrary to God's word, we respond in anger. We need to respond in love. We need to have hearts so, so bare, so raw that God is touched that we begin to feel like God feels because we see like God sees. Because others need to know the love of God because it is the loving kindness of God that brings about repentance. If we would believe it first. If my people who were called by my name would humble themselves and pray, then I would heal their land. That's us. Dear God of heaven, have your way with us. Lead us and guide us. May we be faithful to let you have your way with us that others might know you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have questions, get a hold of me. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks for being here.